Hey, this is Norm from Tesla.com. I'm here joined by Mike McLaughlin. You're the chief engineer at the John Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and you and your team have made this robotic arm. It's, it doesn't look like a claw. It looks almost like a human hand. Uh, can you tell me about the research as, that went into this arm? Sure. Well, this, this it was designed to be exactly what you mentioned, to look like a human arm, because it was designed to be a prosthetic limb. Mm. And so it was really designed to replace the human hand. Um, and so to do that, we had to build a robot system that had the same strength as a human. So that can curl 45 pounds, mm. okay? We can do a pinch grip of 20 pounds. So it has really human-like strength, okay? And it's the same size as a human arm, and it weighs about the same amount as a human arm. Those parameters seem really limiting when you go to a roboticist, because you can put powerful servos, but it's, it's really difficult. What type of and, and motors and servos are you using to get it to those, that size, that power, and that dexterity? Yeah, so the, these are um, brushless DC motors, they, and they were very carefully designed, so they have a very high torque to size ratio. Mm. And so, then that was one of the key things in making this successful. Now, we can also scale these things. So, you can make the same, take the same motor technology and put it in a larger form factor, and you have a, an arm now that's much stronger than a human arm. It's going to be bigger, right. okay, but it's much stronger. In fact, the uh, Virginia Tech team is using a variant of those arms on its robot system. Okay? It's one of the few robots in the competition that actually has, a, 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 in this case, a three-finger hand, but it, it, but it was all based on this technology. And then with that, you get all the advantages that humans get of the dexterity of the hand, whether it's for opening a door, diffusing a bomb, diffusing an IED, and that's why you, for example, have one mounted on just a four-wheeled robot. It right. would take the jobs that normally a soldier would have to go into and, and do themselves, right? Right, yeah, so, I mean, we operate in environments that were designed for humans, so we don't want to have to redesign them so the, uh, the robot can operate in that environment. And so what we, you know, we wanted to do here was to create a robotic system uh, that mimic the human hand, initially to replace the human hand, but ultimately, you know, put that into a robot system that could operate in environments that were designed for, for humans. So, you know, be able to do things like type on a keyboard or, um, you know, do very fine manipulations that, you know, robots today cannot do very easily. And so, so what are the, the challenges? Is it control, responsiveness, feedback? For someone wearing this as a prosthetic, how do they control it even? Yeah, so for somebody wearing this as a prosthetic, what we try to do is uh, allow the person to control this in a very natural way. So you, you, you move your hand all the time, and you don't really think a lot about it, okay? Mm -hmm. But you do very complex things. You're actually doing a lot just holding that microphone right now to make sure you don't drop it. And so, but our brains do that very easily. So if you try to convert that into some, uh, say using an Xbox controller or some other type, of, it'd be very difficult to do what you're seeing here, okay? Um, so what we try to do is really to tap into the signals into the, in the brain, okay? And by tapping into those signals, we can actually determine what you want to do so that the arm can really kind of interpret what you want to do and learn how to understand your brain signals as opposed to you having to learn how to use the arm. You mean some okay. actual neural mapping with, with electrodes yeah. and... Absolutely, and, and what we find with, with patients that we've worked with is, is this sense of, um, they really talk about this being like an extension of themselves. They don't really wow. think of it as a robotic arm, and it's a really amazing thing. And part of that is because it's so human-like, okay? So, um, you know, when you, uh, your brain says wiggle your fingers, you know, and they, it sees your, the fingers wing, wiggle like that in a very natural way. It, it sort of, you know, it has an easy job, you know, mapping it into what it used to have. And it, the movement here, at least in this animation, very lifelike. It looks like how I would move my hand. Even can move in some ways that my fingers don't even think they can. They can move in the trials of this arm for patients using prosthetics. Uh, what's the process of getting them to control the system? Okay, so we have two basic ways that we do it. So somebody that's an amputee. The nerves that used to go to their amputated arm are still there somewhere. And so we can tap into those nerves. And we do that uh, either by, in a case where somebody has, say, maybe they're missing a hand. If you put your, your hand around your forearm and you wiggle your fingers, you can feel all those muscles move, okay? And so we can actually use electrodes to pick up those signals and um, then interpret what you want to do, again, by looking at those patterns. So somebody thinks about opening and closing their hand, do, do it very naturally. Somebody has a more severe amputation, 
Um, in that case, th there's a surgical procedure called targeted muscle re -innervation. And in that case, what happens is, is the nerve that, say, used to go down to my bicep, um, I now take that nerve and I move it to, say, another piece of muscle on the chest. So now if I think flex my bicep, mm -hmm. I'll have a little muscle contraction in my chest, okay? And I can do that for a number of different nerves. And then I can, with surface electrodes, I can detect those patterns again. So again, for somebody that's moving their arm, they just think about bending their elbow, and they, and they can do it. So it becomes a very straightforward thing for them to do. The third thing is, so somebody that says has had a spinal cord injury, all right, the nerves are all still there, it's just the connections are broken. And so then what we can, we can do, we can actually go into the brain. So we have these small electrode arrays that are about the size of my small fingernail. Um, that are actually placed on the surface of the brain, and we put those in the areas associated with motor movement. And then when you think about moving, we pick up all those signals, and then we decode them, and then we turn them into something that the, will move the arm, okay? And that interpretation, that's a big part of the challenge, yeah. still trying to figure that out. Yeah, so it really gives you a number of different modalities in which you can interface with the patient. Uh, that depends on upon you know their circumstances. Okay, so somebody that you know has a fairly substantial amount of residual limb, they don't need brain surgery to to uh, put in an array. Um, you know what they need is just something you know very simple on their remaining limb. Okay, somebody that's in more, you know had a more serious condition um, would would you know benefit more from a um, a more complex solution. Okay. And ultimately, what we hope to do is that, that a lot of these things will go non-invasive. So, you know, so there won't be any surgery at all required. What are the next challenges that for improving this system, and what is the research leading you now? Yeah, well, the thing we're really focused on now is, so we have 26 joints here that we control with 17 motors. We have several hundred sensors on this arm. So when it interacts with this environment, it touches something. Um, we sense the pressure in the fingertips or uh, the amount of uh, strain on the wrist. And we're only, we haven't really figured out how to control all that capability, okay? And so that's a really our change. So it's like, you know, we have a Ferrari and what we do is we drive around our, our block, you know, and that, you know, we don't take it out and race it, okay? And what we really need to learn how to do is, is get the, the software and the, you know, the control technologies, the automation, to kind of catch up with what this is physically able to do. That's amazing. It's an incredible robotics demonstration. Thank you so much, okay. Mike, for showing Great. it to us. Thank you. Thank you.